Hey everybody, this is Scott. Welcome back to Pink TV. I've got a deal example I want to share with you today. I'm really excited because this video lesson, I've got a couple of really, really great lessons I want to share. It's chock full of some really, really cool strategies and what we're doing today and how we are countering all of the external intangible forces that we can't control, i.e. interest rate increases, inflation the highest in 40 years, a hyperinflated seller's market that is now becoming more real and all of which or none of which we can control. So the question is in business and specifically real estate, how do you proactively counter those forces that can ultimately sideline or put a big curveball in your strategy or plan? I'm going to share with you exactly what we're doing today which is why I'm very excited about it. So this video specifically is about how to utilize private funds or OPM, other people's money, to purchase investment properties. They don't have to be pretty. You're not driving all your friends by and telling them how excited you are that you own this property. It can be an ugly duck. If it makes money, that is what matters. And this deal here is nothing special. It's your run of the mill, you know, kind of block home here in Jacksonville, Florida, but it's a money maker for us. And at the end of the day, it's just a cookie cutter deal. These deals exist in every city in the country. Right now, these deals are in your backyard. I don't care where you live. I can guarantee you that. I'm also going to tell you as of the filming of this video, there are more and more opportunities that we're seeing cross our desks every day. And ultimately, I'm going to share with you why we say screw the banks, screw the banks, screw the interest rates. There's a better way to do it. Now, let me tell you about how we found this deal. There's really four simple steps in this deal. Guys, real estate isn't complicated. You have to know what you're doing when it comes to making a purchase. Yes, there are simple strategies and systems to find out the max amount, amount you should pay, uh, how you should rehab homes. There are certainly things that you need to be wise about when it gets to the specifics of the deal and how you're going to ultimately exit the property. But when it comes to the actual outlay and really the overview of, of, of what we're doing here, it's very simple. There's really four steps. You find the deal, uh, you find the money, and that can be in reverse order. I'm going to talk about that in a second. You rehab it and you sell it. There's not a lot more moving parts to that. You have a couple variations on your exit strategy and arguably some same uh, similar variations in your renovation, but ultimately these are the four simple steps to doing the deal that I'm going to show you about. So step number one is finding the deal. One of the first things I tell people, and we work with a lot of people here at Pink, uh, if what we talk about is of interest to you, if you feel there's synergy, there'll be links and ways you can contact us to see how you can work with us if you have interest in doing so. Number one, when we tell people to go out there and kind of get a presence in your market, you don't have to spend a lot of money to have leads coming your way. One of the things that I've taught for many, many years that was taught to me is if you find the deal, the money will come. Now, that can be a, a lot of hot air in some circles because if you have no lines in the water, you're beginning, you don't have anybody that you know that might be a private lender, that's kind of a daunting proposition. I'm going to go find a deal, put it under contract, put money on the table as a deposit, so now I have skin in the game so I don't walk away and I'm just supposed to go find $250,000. You know, that's kind of daunting. So there's a real strong argument if you don't have lines in the water. So it, there's an argument that maybe the horse should come in front of the cart, cart or the buggy. But in many cases, with where I am and with the circle I have, uh, I've always got lines in the water. So there are many times, in fact, if we have a deal, we're going to write it whether we have the capital lined up or not. We'll always find it. If you don't know anything about private lenders, it really is a huge key to the door. I've done uh, multiple videos on this. We did a great video that really breaks down how you can go and find them in your sphere of influence, your circle. Right now, there are people in your world, whether you think it or not, that could be potential private lenders for you. I go through a video, I walk through exactly how to identify your top 10. Out of that top 10, you pick your top three, and I tell you what to say to them, how they're secured, how to make it a very easy opportunity that you're giving them. You're not begging for money. In fact, I stress that in the video. You're not begging for money. You're giving them a really viable opportunity. And when you show them the math and the numbers they can make and how they're secured, it's really a no-brainer for the right person. But ultimately, most people watching this video will be a lot more comfortable if they have private money lined up before they make offers, and that is fine. Of course, you re are required to provide a proof of funds in many cases when you're dealing with agents and REOs, so sometimes having an investor that can show you that the money's available can be important to making your offer, but ultimately, in my world, you find the deal, we will find the money. In fact, we even do that for our partners. You find the deal, we'll find you the money. Cart, horse, 
whatever you're comfortable with, but the reality is that step two was finding a private lender. And of course, we're, they're secure, they're paid a nice interest rate. Um, it's really a great investment opportunity for the right investor. So step one, step two, step three is rehab. Now, let me just share real briefly on the rehab. I can't wait to kind of hide the numbers here. I don't want to cheat and you guys look behind me because this is a really cool way that we sold the property. And I want you to know exactly how we did it so you can emulate that in your own market. Rehabs, we look at them in two ways probably more ways than that, but in this case, two different options, if you will. If we were going to flip the property tomorrow and uh, we were going right back on the open market, we want to make a quick buck, you know, the market's been crazy. If you can have a property, you're going to participate in that high seller inflated kind of competitive atmosphere we've dealt with the past two years. So if you can find the deal, the great news is you had a real easy time selling it. But if your intent is to flip it tomorrow or as soon as the rehab's done, you need to understand that you're now competing with every other house that's for sale out there, which means it's got to be a primo, first class, top notch rehab job, which is in your mind you say, well, why wouldn't it be? Why would I rehab a house and not do a great job on it? I'm not suggesting that. What I'm suggesting is that you better do a perfect job or a close to perfect job because buyers that have a bank loan in their back pocket are looking at every property in that area that they can afford which means you're competing with all the others. Now, problem with that in today's world, with interest rates rising, with payments correlating and rising as well, uh, and the reality of inflation and buyers cooling down and sellers coming down on their price and all of the chatter. By the way, the more chatter, the more articles written, the more people talking about it, the more it perpetuates into a reality. In fact, the re <laughs> you want to know where, what happens in many cases when, when markets shift, it's because the perception of that market gets talked about so much that it ends up manifesting and kind of shifting because of that in large part. All sorts of chatter right now for a lot of good reason. Last thing you want to do is get caught in the middle of a cycle. You're trying to rehab the property, you are rehabbing it, and you're planning on an ARV and a resale value here, and all of a sudden values start to drop, it could screw up your entire math and your entire kind of methodology as your approach to the property. So nothing wrong, when you rehab a property, you should want to make it special. Now, making the Taj Mahal is another story. We have a video series on rehabs and some of the big mistakes investors make when they're acting like they're going to live there, that they're going to make it theirs, that they're going to show their family and friends what a great rehab job they did when they shouldn't be doing the work themselves to begin with. Some people just don't listen, but at the end of the day, you're rehabbing it to sell. But the second option, which is the one we did here, is a little bit of a lesser rehab, meaning we still did the mechanicals and the major costs that need to be fixed. Buyers can't do roofs, as, as in general. They can't do uh, heating and air. They can't get under and do plumbing. Most can't do electric. So those things are big fixes that we always go in and fix. But there are certain times where instead of replacing the kitchen cabinets, if they're uh, in decent shape, we may paint them, put some new hardware in. If we were flipping that property, we'd probably need to replace those cabinets so it was modern and new and competitive with the other properties. You know, same with the bathroom. I love the example. You can get those really, you know, 12 by 12, 18 by 18 tiles, ceramic tiles that are, you know, diagonally put in the shower, and they look fantastic. You can also get the little four inch by four inch tiles that are also brand new that look fantastic for a fraction of the cost. Either way, you're walking into a brand new ceramic tile shower and bathroom, but the cost in the materials is drastically different. So if you have a rehab where you're not needing to flip it, you're going to do a lease option or a delayed flip or a rental or rent to own you can do a little less rehab. Now, please do not mistake that for slapping some paint on and putting some pig on the lipstick and thinking that that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying that at all, but the difference in selling traditionally today to on the traditional market and selling to what would be considered a non-traditional buyer, someone that's gonna be buying it on a lease with an option or rent to own, those are different rehabs, at least in some small ways. And I hope that all makes sense. So. Rehabbing and is going to be predicated a lot on what your exit strategy is going to be. And I don't need to repeat myself. That is what we base the rehab on and it's what we did here. Fourth and final step in this simple four step process is selling it. Let me tell you a little secret that isn't such a secret anymore. When you open up a property for sale and you're willing to work with a buyer who cannot walk into the bank today and qualify for a traditional or institutional loan, that opens the floodgates for buyers. Creative financing, non-traditional real estate has been around forever. 
I can tell you in any market, hot market, cold market, buyer's market, seller's market, up market, down market, high inflation, low inflation, there's always people out there that would love to buy a home that may not walk into a bank. Biggest misnomer is they just have garbage credit and you know they must just not pay their bills. We deal with a lot of people that are self-employed business owners, people that own a business that make good money, in some cases make a lot of money, and they have access to a lot of money, but they write a lot of it all off on their tax returns. And what are banks looking at to make decisions on loans? Your net income on your tax return. So if you write everything off, it shows you don't make any money. Many self-employed business owners have access to a lot of money. Many have a lot of money, but banks don't like to lend to them because they make their money in spurts. They make their money in spurts. I'd tell you self-employed business owners uh, are probably the hardest working people in America. But because their income can be viewed as inconsistent, banks are, are apprehensive to lend to them. So you open up a great property and you're willing to sell it on a lease with an option to buy or rent to own or just a rental, you're going to have the floodgates opened up. I can tell you and I can almost guarantee wherever you live, you do the right marketing for a terms buyer, a lease to own, an executive lease purchase, what we call it in our world, a rent to own, whatever you call it, it's going to open up the floodgates with potential buyers. And so that strategy was what we implemented here. And I'm going to tell you exactly what we're doing going forward so we don't get caught uh, with the midstream in the middle of a rehab and all of a sudden the banks and the interest rates and the Fed and all of these external factors we can't control screw up our formula. So I'm going to tell you exactly what we did here. So four easy steps. Real estate isn't that complicated. Uh, you have to have the right people in your circle and know the right things, but, but ultimately there's just not a lot more to the deal than that. So, okay, let me tell you about this street. It's a property called Wakefield. Now, don't look at this. You're not allowed to cheat here. I know you guys like my boxes. The boxes, I get made fun of a lot here, but the boxes make it easier to read. And I wanted to put it all on one here, so I hope, hope it's legible. So try to stay away from this for just the time being. Okay. These were the actual numbers. Uh, that was not the street name, by the way. The street name is not Screw the Banks. That would be kind of funny. Maybe not. Anyway, uh, the street was on a street called Wakefield, and we literally just got this deal finished. So property came in, nothing special, $112,000. However, it's a decent little pocket of homes. Believe it or not, it's like three or four blocks from the river. Um, it's just a cool little part of town, but the property was distressed. It came through an agent, so it was on the MLS, which means that it came through an REO agent. In this case, it was a bank foreclosure, uh, and ultimately, we ended up uh, buying it. Uh, the list price was 112. We pegged the ARV at 170. Now, typically, if the ARV is 170, and we're gonna sell it on terms, which is how we sold it here, we always add a premium in the price because we're essentially taking the risk of selling to a buyer who can't walk into the bank and qualify today. For that reason, there is a premium added on top, number one. Number two, we're locking that buyer into a price today that they don't have to reflect or recognize for really the next 12 months. So even though there's a lot of external factors going on and uh, ultimately I think prices are gonna have to come down, in Florida, which people say down here is recession proof, uh, there's 900 people a day move into Florida and they're not staying with me and they're not staying with Andrew behind the camera. They gotta stay somewhere. So you get a lot of people, sun and beaches and Orlando and Disney, uh, no, no income tax. I mean, there's a lot of really cool features in Florida which make it, and of course, supply is very limited. However, uh, I don't know how values are gonna fare down here, nobody does. But ultimately, if we're locking you in today as a buyer, we're gonna put a premium. So even though 170 is our ARV, 179.9 is actually the price that we sold it at. You'll see in just a second. And I need about 20 in repair or rehab. Now, if we were gonna flip this property, it might need 25 in rehab. Um, maybe even 30, right? We would do some things a little bit more. $20,000 didn't need a lot, by the way. $20,000 does get you some work, not a ton, but it does get you somewhere. Uh, and ultimately, that's all the property needed based on our exit strategy. So these are the actual numbers. I'm going to show you our profit, but the coolest part is how we sold it and how we believe it's a strategy you should implement as well to try and weather any sort of upcoming storms with the market, economy, interest rates, etc. Negotiated the deal, bought it at $98,000. By the way, we always are the first in the door or we try to be. Somebody calls us, we will try and drop what we're doing to get there. I've always believed in getting a quick response when a deal comes through. Paid about 2,500 bucks in closing costs. The rehab ended up only costing us about 18,000 bucks. So we factored 20, end up spending about 18 in the rehab. Uh, I just saw the pictures, by the way. Uh, they look really, really great. And I hadn't even seen them yet. Um, I saw the rehab, but didn't know how good the pictures ultimately turned out. The cost of our money in this deal is about 6,250. Now, 
FYI, full transparency, cards on the table. We agreed on this deal to pay our investor two points, which a point is 1% of the value for those that don't know. So, and, and we borrowed uh, effectively uh, 130,000, so a point is $1,300. So, and we also agreed to pay 12% interest on the money. Now, I'll talk about that in just a second, but those terms, they're not bad. In fact, they're about real into what you could expect to pay a private lender. You'll get all sorts of opinions on whether or not that's a good rate, good points or not. I can tell you I'm in the world, I'm in the market every day talking to lenders, uh, institutional, private and otherwise. Those are rates that are real and that are attractive enough to get you the money today for whatever it's worth. All in some change, call it a buck twenty-five. We're all into the deal. Everything, and by the way, we're not paying off sixty-two fifty up front, but call in, we're all in 125k. I'm a big fan of what we call overfinancing. I always like to borrow a little bit of money more so than we need to do the job. Reason being very simple. You found the deal, you've got to go look at the deal, you've got to meet contractors, you have to oversee the renovation, you have to market it, you have to sell it, you have showings. Nobody wants to work for free. So if you can get five grand, seven grand up front, basically buy a check, excuse me, buy a house, get a check, you, we literally walk from closing with a check. It makes it a little bit of a better process because you've got a couple bucks in your pocket as you're going through the repairs. So we teach our people always borrow a minimum five thousand dollars, usually between five and ten thousand dollars, depending on uh, where your equity position is. How much room do you have in the deal? In this case, we borrowed about five thousand dollars more, give or take. So put five in our pocket right up front. Payment to the investor, by the way, is about twelve fifty a month. Keep that in mind. So here is our profit on the deal. I'm going to tell you exactly how we sold it. In fact, let me tell you how we sold it first and I'll break the numbers down because they only get better as time goes on. We sold the property on a lease with an option to buy. Now, we have a few ways that we sell lease options here. One are we called ELPs or executive lease purchase and others we just call kind of lease to own. What's the difference? Well, it's all internal. The world wouldn't have a clue what the difference is other than what's internal here at Little Pink Houses and how we do things. But ELPs for us typically are deals where we need to get our buyer in and out of the property within about a 12 to 24 month window. So anyone that we're working with to sell it to, they have to be able to get a bank loan within about a year or two. Uh, when we're, so we're really going hard at trying to qualify them. When we sell it like this, uh, which what we're calling is really referred to behind the circle here as golden goose uh, is we're giving someone five years to qualify for a loan and so it doesn't really matter how they are today we qualify them but it's not as stringent as long as they can afford the down payment on the monthly and we think in five years they can get a loan we're usually going to work with them if we have a good feel we don't have to worry about what's going to happen today tomorrow and the next year the next even two years we give them plenty of time and here's how we sell it, and I'm going to tell you the buyers eat it up. It's a great, great platform and a great way for the buyers to buy. Here's how we priced it. Year one is $180,000. Remember, $179,900. I've learned in doing math examples, it's a lot easier to just say instead of $179,900, $180. It makes it a lot easier for you to understand and for me to tell. Year one is $180,000. We took 10% down payment. We require about 10% on every home we sell, especially if we're rehabbing them. If we're not rehabbing them, we'll work with a little bit lower down payment. But in this case, because we did a, a, a fairly full rehab, and ironically, I just realized this, we got all of our rehab money back from the down payment. Doesn't matter because we borrowed the rehab money, so the 18 goes in our pocket. Now, I'm gonna show you that in a minute. $1,600 a month payment, which gives us about a $250 a month cash flow if you factor in taxes and insurance. So we're gonna make $250 to $300 a month uh, over the course of a year, about $3,600 in positive cash flow. Now, if the buyer doesn't get a loan in the first 12 months, so they don't go to the bank and what's called exercise their option to buy the property. Lease option, by the way, is defined as a lease. You're leasing the house and you have the option to buy it. So when you want to exercise your option, that simply means telling the party you're buying it from, I'm going to exercise my option and I'd like to purchase the property. So if they exercise their option year one, there's their terms. If they say, can't do it in year one, but in from month 12 to 24, year two, they decide they want to exercise their option, that's a different price. It's also a higher monthly. The monthly payment would increase by $100 per year. Now, depending on where you live, this can be different. If you live in a high median area, Los Angeles, Orange County, you know where the average price out there is 800 grand, 
$10,000 a year is probably light. It should be maybe $25,000 a year as far as a price increase. Now, what you're saying is at home watching is saying, well, wait a minute here. What if there's a downturn in the market? What if values drop? What if the interest rates that are continue to go up there are going to go up again this year? Uh, the Fed is even telling you they're going to go up again. What happens when the market and the sellers have to drop their price? It's a great question. First of all, nobody has a crystal ball. Nobody knows when that's going to happen, and I would say even if it's going to happen in certain places, maybe Florida. Depends on what happens. We don't know that. What I can also tell you is we've had discussions till we're blue in the face about how you price things out when it comes to the future values. The conclusion has been very simple after all sorts of chatter. You have to make the best decision you can with the facts as you have them in front of you today. So we don't know what values are going to be like. If values drop, then the, sell, the buyer doesn't have to exercise their option in year two. Nothing that says they have to. And there's nothing that says that we have to drop our price to make up for whatever the value is at that time. If they want to buy it in year two, they'd have to make up the difference. It's that simple. Or they can wait a year till values come back. I, you know, there are different options that they would have. We just don't know if that's going to happen, so we can't borrow that trouble. You make the best decisions you can with the facts in front of you. So year two is 190. And 1700 year three is 200,000, 1800 a month, or so on, so forth, 210, 1900, and ultimately 220 and $2,000 a month. So if they exercise at any point within this window of time, they have a predetermined price. So we don't have to go back and bicker or dictate, uh, or I should say negotiate. And we also don't need to worry about values continue to appreciate and we don't become uh, the beneficiary of that. And by the way, I've learned a lot about these types of deals. If you're not forcing your buyer to get a loan, some will and some won't. Some people have life happen to them. Now, we like to create homeowners here. That's a big theme at our company. When we're trying to get people to buy a house in the first 12 to 24 months, we're working really hard to qualify them. We're forcing them into a credit repair program. We're putting them with a bank from quite literally before they even move into the house. They're working with a lender that's going to give them the money in the next year or two. And we're on them every month with monthly reports and check-ins. And we want them to go get a loan so they can get the deed to the house in their name. When we do it like this, we're not as anxious for them to go do it. And the more time that goes by, sometimes life just gets in the way. Uh, and then the people end up getting a divorce. They have a job transfer. They move. And you do it again. And then you start the cycle over. You collect another big down payment, 10%. Uh, you get a higher cash flow at that point, depending on in, where in the cycle of five years they are. Uh, and ultimately, it's kind of the gift that can keep on giving. So. They get a loan, cash out, you make a big hit. They don't, you keep the asset, you continue to cash flow, and you get another big down payment. It can be a great strategy. So very quickly, profit, we borrowed about seven grand more than we needed right up front. Now that's our pre-profit. I'm not arguing that, but we put it in our pocket today. We also got $18,000 from the down payment. So right off the bat, we got 25 grand in our pocket. So let's not pretend like we're not making some money here when we're selling it on a longer term. We've got 25,000 bucks in our pocket right up front, really within the first 45 days of buying the property. It wasn't a major rehab, took a long time. We've got $32,000 in equity right now. So if, uh, and that's by the way, just the difference between the 180 minus the 18,000 they put down. So we have another, so if someone bought it in the first year, we would walk with 57 grand. So we'd be in, in the deal for a buck and a quarter, walk with 57. Have a nice day, right? Someone buys it in year two, we'd make 67. Year three, 77, and so on. Every year that goes by, we make $100 more, $1,200 per year in cash flow and $10,000 per year in the sale price. So whenever they cash out, it's up to them. We're not going to force them. And if they cash out, great. If they don't, we'll do it again. This could be really the golden goose that continues to provide a good stream of revenue for us. But this here really eliminates what the Fed's going to say and what the rates are going to do and if buyers can afford it because you're screwing the banks. You're cutting out the middleman, which is the bank. You're dealing directly with the buyer. They're dealing directly with you. And when they can not worry about having to get a loan today, but can have all the benefits of ownership, they can make the house theirs. They can, can claim the benefits of ownership. By the way, you don't have to be a landlord. Probably one of the biggest features I haven't even shared till the very end here. When they are buying on a lease option, they become responsible for the repairs, upkeep and maintenance of the property. You're no longer a landlord and so another big big benefit so I would tell you this uh, in conclusion our company made a pivot here we love buying them for cash we always are active in the creative financing space we've got multiple deals right now that we have under options agreements for deed 
Subject Twos. One of our partners is cashing a deal out on Monday. This coming Monday, in three days, I know dates don't matter on these videos, making $94,000 on one deal. 94 grand. How would that feel putting that in your bank? $94,000. And you know what? They're good folks. They deserve it. Uh, and it's a deal that uh, is going to change their life, by the way, and they've already told me that. What would a $94,000 check in your bank account on Monday look like? Let that sink in for a minute. So it's a great business. If you like what you're hearing, there's going to be some information how you can work with us. Uh, let us know. We're always looking for good folks to work with. But I want you to know, as a company, we have really pivoted in a way to try to get ahead of any sort of storms that are coming, ahead of external factors and influences that we can't control. Doesn't matter what the Fed does. Doesn't matter what the economy does. Doesn't matter what inflation, where it goes. Now, it does matter, but at the end of the day, those are not going to kill our ability to go make a lot of money in real estate. If you're flipping houses and you have to live on that next flip, what happens if the values go down while you're in the middle of it? Or what happens if you don't get the price and then you have to pay an agent and then you have to drop the value and there's just a slippery slope there. If you can borrow your money up front to give you enough time to do this deal, over the next five years, things are going to be fine. Maybe not in the next six to 12 or 18 months, but over the course of five years, they're going to be fine. It's going to be worth a lot more in five years than it is today. I can guarantee you that. This is a great way, great strategy. I'd even call it a secret for you to weather any storms in front of you as well. I feel like I talked a lot. I feel like I talked fast, which I like to do. Most importantly, I hope you got some good takeaways from the video. We always appreciate you watching us here on Pink TV. I will see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.